think I might finally have hit on something. If I can keep this clipped so that my mic doesn't fall to the floor if it's not on my ear, then I don't need to have it on my ear while I'm wrestling with my mask. We'll see if that works a little bit. Good morning. Good morning. I hope you are all doing well this morning. Um, I would invite you to take your pew Bibles. Our uh, scripture this morning is coming from Matthew 21, verses 33 through 46, and it is found on page 735 of your pew Bible. Let's open with a word of prayer. Gracious and mighty God, we praise and thank you for your word. We thank you for your written word given to us in our scriptures that we may know your laws and your commandments and the way you would have us live our lives. And we praise and thank you, Lord, for the living word, for the word made flesh, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who came to open the scriptures to us and to show us through word and deed, through his life, death, and resurrection, what it truly means to live in the kingdom of God, loving God and neighbor. We ask your blessing upon us as we read and hear and speak your written word. Through it, may we be challenged and strengthened to hear and know and follow the living word, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. All throughout this gospel, we have been uh, reading among other things, we have been reading and hearing about this um, little battle that's been going on, sometimes a battle of words, of wits, between the scribes, the Pharisees, the elders, the chief priests, the rulers, um, and Jesus. Just keep that in mind. Matthew 21, beginning with verse 33. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, they killed another, and they stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of him and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him a share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scripture, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone? The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All through this gospel and through much of the other gospels, you might find yourself shaking your head and thinking, oh, they just don't get it. The Pharisees, that is, and the scribes, and the rulers, and the chief priests, and, and all of that group who keep trying to entrap Jesus asked him seemingly unanswerable questions. But here they get it. 
Here it says explicitly, the scribes and the Pharisees knew he was talking about them. So what was their reaction when they realized that this parable, like the other parables he has told, is meant to teach, but also realize that this parable condemns many of its very hearers. What is their reaction? They look to, for a way to arrest him. They may have gotten it, finally, but it didn't change them at all. Remember in our prayer of confession just now, we confess that too often we are informed by God's commandments, but not transformed by them. You know, it's interesting because if we're informed by God's commandments, it may be that we know them and just don't care. It may also be that we know them and try our best to follow them and keep tabs on ourselves and, and pray with accountability partners so that we can count off the days, like two days alcohol free, three days alcohol free, five days gossip free, that sort of thing. We can keep the commandments and be informed by them, but still not be transformed by them. The chief priests and the Pharisees and the scribes and the etc. etc. were not transformed. They understood. Now what is it they understood? There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he went to the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. You've heard landowner before in parables. The landowner is gone. He built a vineyard, put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, built a watchtower, cared for it, did all that was necessary, and rented it out to tenants to steward it, to care for it, and to bear fruit. Not only to bear fruit, but to bear good fruit. And to make sure that fruit got where it needed to get. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They killed one, they beat one, they stoned a third, they sent other tenants. Remember John the Baptist? Remember the voice calling out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths? Do you remember the question that Jesus volleyed back to the chief priests and the elders when they asked him a question. He said, hmm, they asked him, by what authority are you doing all of this stuff? And he turned around and asked them, let me ask you a question. John's baptism, was it from heaven? Or was it from humankind? They knew the answer to that one too, but they struggled to find an acceptable, politically correct answer that would both make them look good and make Jesus look wrong. They couldn't find one. They couldn't find one, so they just said, I don't know. Remember John the Baptist? 
the landowner sent his servants to collect the fruit from the tenants. They beat one, they stoned another, they killed a third. More servants were sent, more servants were killed. So the landowner does something kind of makes sense, kind of doesn't. Some of you will read this and think, oh, okay, that makes sense. Some of you will read this and think, what good does he think that will do? Because the landowner sends his son. And the landowner's rationale for this is, they didn't respect my servants because they were just servants. But they will respect my son because he's the heir of the king. Maybe makes sense. Maybe you're thinking, my gosh, they've already killed like six or seven people. Who thinks they're going to spare the son? Um, and this actually turns out to be the case because the landowners think, oh, here's the son. Oh, this is awesome. Because like, if we kill him, we'll inherit. As if they were younger sons. Thinking that if the son was killed, they would inherit just as in succession, in family succession and inheritance, if the eldest son died, the next eldest would inherit, and so on and so forth. It's a killer. And that's where the parable ends. And Jesus says, what do you think the landowner will do? I need to stay with a camera view seeing my husband shifting, um, and <laughs> me shifting. Um, what do you think the landowner's going to do? To tenants who killed at least four, five, six, who knows how many servants of the landowner, and the landowner's son. Do you really think the king is going to say, Okay, well, there's nobody left to send. I guess y'all get the vineyard. You need to stop paying me rent now. No, that's not what's going to happen. He will put those wretches to a wretched end. They're not going to inherit. They're jockeying for position. They're jealousy. Their murderousness isn't going to get them an inheritance. As my son would say, duh. And the tenants are, of course, the scribes, the Pharisees the chief priests, the elders, all of those who all along have been doing everything they can to undermine Jesus' kingdom. And it's a power grab, absolutely, to be sure. But it is more than just a power grab. These rulers are scared. They are scared out of their minds that Jesus will ruin everything. They're afraid that Jesus, with his acceptance of unacceptable people, with, his, with all this love your neighbor as yourself stuff, will ruin everything. And how on earth could love and justice and acceptance ruin everything? There's some who talk about the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious leaders and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. All of those people as people who just can't take change. They're just set in their ways. But y'all, it's so much more than that. It's so much more than that. The Israelites have been enslaved 
almost more years than they have existed as a nation. And they're oppressed now. And the religious leaders think that if they keep the Torah, like really keep the Torah, like every jot, every tittle, every everything, if they can make sure that not neither they nor anyone else come anywhere close to breaking the law, then God will be good to them and will release them from captivity once again. And if this means that some people aren't going to get to be in the temple and worship God or the synagogues, so be it. If this means that people that you might otherwise feel sorry for aren't given the time of day because they are ritually unclean, so be it. We will do what we have to do. That was the point of view of the religious leaders. They weren't just sticking the muds. They weren't just old phones. They were scared. And that is absolutely no excuse. That is absolutely no excuse. They recognize, you can see it in some of the parables, in some of the discussions, in some of the reactions to the crowds and the healings. You can see it. There are times when they recognize exactly who Jesus is. And it scares them even more. It scares them even more. But remember these words that you'll find in the New Testament. Perfect love casts out all fear. And then these, um, faith, hope, and love, these three abide. But the greatest of these is love. That's a recurring theme in the kingdom, isn't it? Love. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. But if love meant touching unclean people or even coming anywhere near them, if love meant including those who were not supposed to be included, if love includes healing people on the Sabbath, for heaven's sake, they were too scared to let it in. Their fear overwhelmed any sense that following God meant love. They would choose fear over love every single time. Even here, I mean, they're not even talking about love. They shoot loves out the window, but they knew he was talking about him. And they looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid. Can you be, can you imagine being stuck between two fears that were so overwhelming? Can you imagine being that stuck? And not seeing a way out. When the way out, ironically, this standing 
standing right in front of him, condemning him through a parable, yes, at this point. But at any moment, any one of those hearers of that parable from the lowest class servant to the highest class leader, at any moment, if any one of his hearers said, oh my gosh, I understand, I want the kingdom, tell me what to do. Jesus is right there, it would have been all good. It would have been all good. They knew that Jesus was telling a story about them, that Jesus knew they were going to kill the son. And instead of being convicted by that story, instead of being changed by that story, instead of being transformed by that story, they lived into it. They looked for a way to arrest him. Friends, there are things that we are all afraid of, or there are things, all of us have things that we are afraid of, all of us. but we cannot let them come between us and the kingdom. We cannot let them come between us and Jesus Christ. And just think about it. We don't need to because God is love. And God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son that whoever believed in him, whoever follows him, whoever chooses to be an apprentice of Jesus will not die, but have eternal life. There is nothing to fear. You know, sometimes Christians are accused of and I say accused because I'm talking about the perspective of uh, those who are not followers of Jesus, can be accused of being a little harsh, trying to scare people into Christianity by scaring them with, with stories of hell and fire and brimstone and eternal punishment and damnation and the devil and all those other words that you can think of. Think about it. These religious leaders were more scared of heaven than they were of hell. They were more scared of the kingdom of God than anything else. Say that again. Let that kind of sink in. They were terrified of the kingdom of God. because they thought they would never be free again. But Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. Jesus says you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. Friends, if you're scared, Find someone to talk to. Find someone to help you. Lean on your brothers and sisters. Lean on your community. Lean on your church. Lean on your congregation. Lean on your pastor. But don't let fear separate you from the kingdom. Ever. Let us pray.
Gracious and merciful God, thank you so much for your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for his obedience, for his willingness to suffer and to die for our sakes. Thank you that death did not hold him, that he resurrected from the dead to show us, to bring us hope for our own eternal life. And thank you, gracious God, that that eternal life does not have to wait until we die an earthly death. That it starts now. And thank you for everything that Jesus did in his life on this earth that showed the people of his time and day and, and place and, and us today and everybody in between showed us what the kingdom of God looks like showed us the perfect love that casts out all fear, showed us healing and hope and compassion. Thank you for Jesus Christ, for it is in his name that we pray. Amen.